Dear listeners, good morning and welcome to Comme d'Archi, the podcast that opens the doors to the fascinating world of architecture. For newcomers, let me introduce myself. I'm the spokesperson of Anne-Charlotte Despont, PhD in History of Architecture, published author, head of a communication and development agency based in Paris, France, dedicated to architecture. Let's meet every week to discuss culture and architecture with specialists and learn how to look at projects through a context and diversity lens. Thank you for being with me today, and now it's time for talent. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archi. Dear listeners, this is Esther, and I am delighted to come back to you today on behalf of Anne Charlotte. We come together around a historical subject, that of the Castle of Maison, which we had already briefly discussed this summer 2020. It seemed sad to us to talk more precisely about this topic in the light of Beatrice Vivienne Tessis of the History of Art, who has been interviewed in French in our previous program. This thesis defended at the University of Paris 4 in 2014 under the direction of Claude Mignot is entitled The Residences and Collections of a Great Lord, René de Longueuil, President of Maison, 1597-1677. Indeed, the castle of Maison, which splendor is gradually being restored nowadays with the help of the CMN, National Monument Center, has emerged thanks to this great character, René de Longueuil. René de Longueuil preceded Fouquet at the superintendence of finances of the Kingdom of France. That is how Beatrice sums up her thesis. High magistrate in the Parliament of Paris, superintendent of finances for a year and a half, receiving the king and the court four times in his new castle, important player in the Fronde, banker of the great lords and princess of the blood, familiar to Richelieu, then to Mazarin, lord of many strongholds between Saint-Germain and Maison, René de Longueuil was a powerful man, feared, respected and listened to. Like Nicolas Fouquet, but ten years earlier, he inaugurated a castle which was admired by contemporaries, but he was less imprudent than he. In 1630, he gathered in his hands a seigneurie and one of the most beautiful Parisian mansions with its works of art. Parliamentarian, he was one of the leading intermediates between the Parliament and the royal power during the Fronde. He was close to the royal family. His parliamentary connections were established among the highest nobility and the most high-ranking clerks. Because of his great fortune, he was appointed as superintendent of finances in 1650, attaining the end of the title of Minister of State. He himself obtained in 1658 the title of Marquis. He frequented the world of the Précieuses and he knew Molière. Widowed after 13 years of marriage, he associated his late wife with the castle which he had built by inscribing her heraldry and her supposed portrait in stone. He did not remarry, perhaps to safeguard the family heritage, and took care of the education of his four children. The reason for his relative disgrace remains to have stood up to the king by refusing to cede the harbour master's office of Saint-Germain and Versailles to one of his familiars. One could also have held it against him for his choices during the Fronde. But the problem of the accumulation of loads is posed. Mortar chair, minister of state, captain of the Huns, master of water and forests, lord of Maison and Poissy, the man is wealthy and powerful with a large network of influence. Didn't the king want to stop an ascent that could threaten his power in these troubled times? Longer it would then be the announcement of the case of Fouquet. The president of Maison pursued his rich career and the construction of a magnificent residence which he entrusted to the architect François Mansart. Built on the banks of the Seine, the castle is part of a domain of 330 hectares with multiple outbuildings. The new castle has taken over from the old house, but the two remained side by side for a while and Longueuil lived more in the old castle than in the new one. He only enjoyed about 10 years of the completed ensemble. He lived a lot in construction sites, not hesitating to modify the ceilings of the first floor only 10 years after the completion. But it was imperative for him to follow architectural fashion as closely as possible. 
Mansart opted for innovation with a central crossing hallway, a large open off-center staircase, a facade punctuated by the volumetry and the orders enriched by sculptures in profusion, roofs cut into terraces, side pavilions opening in a ball joint onto the main courtyard, large basements, the plan of the four main apartments developing in symmetry with all the utilitarian rooms. Money doesn't matter. We must salute here his entrepreneurial spirit and the patience he showed to carry out this colossal project. The question of the date of habitability of the castle arises. The axe mentioned in his castle from 1643. Mazarin's and Caston d'Orléans visit in 1643, Ravaud's poem dating of the same year, which gives a perfect description of the place up to the flat roofs and spiral staircases suggests a possible partial occupation from 1643. At this date, the castle is capable of welcoming guests. The sculptors and painters who work on the site are the greatest masters of the time and will form shortly after the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Active on the royal sites before and after Maison, they raised the castle to the rank of royal residence by its sculpted and painted decor. René de Longueuil knew how to choose his craftsmen. René de Longueuil seemed to have taken a great interest in tapestry. He kept the inherited suites while making most important acquisitions. The Parisian mansion situated rue de Bétisy was covered with paintings. The castle of Maison was covered with tapestries. The two residences were complementary. The lord of Maison owned paintings, sculptures and tapestries in abundance. Maison is more imposing. The volumes are immense and the tapestry were better suited for decor which had to be monumental. Everything that made his daily life was of the best provenance of the best manufacturers. Furniture and textiles reached the highest price. Gold or silver stripes, precious metal threads are found in upholstery textile which became a monetary reserve. The chests of the office contain the vermeil and silver crockery, part of which has his coat of arms. The 1677 inventory allows us to discover the porcelain collections that did not appear in 1636, which proves a personal taste for René de Longueuil. They go hand in hand with the abounding cabinets. The art of iron work was not forgotten. The iron doors were so beautiful that they were amongst the curiosities like the orange trees. Finally, the gardens were designed as a place of botanic curiosities with the tulip bed, the rose garden, the double banister staircase and the waterfall. The inventive installation of hydraulics made it possible to cultivate fruits and vegetables of all kinds. The number of orange and lemon trees places René de Longueuil among the biggest collectors of citrus trees. The president of Maison wanted excellence in everything, the very best, including the celebration he gave at the castle. His table was famous and his celebrations were so popular that the royal family invited itself several times. By the recital of these visits and celebrations, we discover that the greatest name of the court came to Maison, Louis XIV, the two queens, Gaston d'Orléans, Mazarin, Madame, Monsieur the Dauphin, let's not forget Louis XIII's visit to the ancient castle. We can imagine that Louis XIII's later came to visit the site so close to Saint-Germain. Longueuil knew how to surround himself with valuable servants. His sommelier, Odigé, was famous for his liqueurs and beverage and published a reference book on the art of running a big house. Some of his servants, the gardeners Massé Villain and Jean Daubré, as well as the butler Barthélemy Janson, spent their entire career with him until their death. Was the president of Maison a collector? Yes. Porcelains and plants are found in the same notion of curiosity and novelty. But like any collector, he made his choices. He developed the collection of porcelains, tapestries and plants, which were novelties and signs of wealth. The collections of paintings and sculptures were acquired to him by inheritance. He probably didn't feel the need to develop them further. But he knew how to acquire master paintings, which may have been a bargaining chip. The sculpture is omnipresent at Maison in the architectural decoration and the statuary he calls it in the garden. 
In everything, the president of Maison knew how to be a man of taste, demanding and tenacious. He got his way. One associates René de Longueuil with Maison. However, Maison should not be dissociated from Paris. René de Longueuil's fortune and all his belongings are calculated by adding the two domiciles which worked together until 1676. We must then broaden the vision and add the territory of Penseret as well as the many strongholds of Maison and Paris. He is the king's very close neighbor at Saint-Germain and his strongholds surround the royal territory. Friend of kings and the greats, happy builder of one of the most beautiful residences in France, owner of a considerable territory possessing immense fortune, René de Longueuil was a powerful man, respected and feared. His personal ambition reflects on his family. He was the founder of a line of marquis for over four generations, during which the goods transmitted only increased, as well as the notoriety of his lineage. State property from 1905, the castle of Maison is gradually regaining its luster. In 2020, the rehabilitation of its gardens began after restoration of its facade. Well, thank you for listening. Take care of yourself and your loved ones and let's meet again next week for a new episode in English. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in to our previous content on Instagram at Comdarchi Podcast. If you like it, make sure to promote the podcast by giving it five stars on Apple Podcast and adding a comment or on any of your favorite podcast platforms. And don't forget to subscribe and listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon. And until then, take care of yourself.